Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 695, and today is October 22nd, 2024. I'm the host of the show, Kyle Anzalone. Got a good amount of news to get through on today's show, so I'm going to jump right into it. Help the show out by sharing the show. It's hosted at the Libertarian Institute. We repost the show on the blog at antiwar.com. YouTube, Rumble, or Odyssey is where you can subscribe and watch the video version of the show. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit the notification bell so they actually tell you when we put out new episodes. Follow me on Twitter at KyleAnslone underscore or the show at con underscore interest. And of course, the podcast is out anywhere you listen to audio podcasts. All right, let's get into the news today. The first story up here I wrote for the Libertarian Institute on October 21st. Around 51,000 Ukrainians have deserted the armed forces this year. So the Ukrainian prosecutor's office has opened up 51,000 cases of desertion through the first time nine months of 2024. This number of soldiers abandoning their posts is likely to double last year's total. So the Times of London reported that data from the Ukrainian government showing that 51,000 criminal cases were initiated for desertion and abandonment of the military unit between January and September of this year. El Paez previously noted that 45,000 Ukrainians were being prosecuted for desertion at the start of August. And so, you know, it seems to me that the number is relatively consistent throughout the year. You know, six, seven, eight thousand added every single month to to the people who are deserting the military. And Al Jazeera says the number is at least thirty thousand. I I was looking and trying to figure out maybe why there's a discrepancy between what Al Jazeera says and what the number of criminal prosecutions are. The only thing I could think of is maybe the 30,000 number is the, the actual troops who have ended up leaving their post where the additional 21,000 would come from people who are maybe given conscription notices and fled the country. So still desertion, still Ukrainians who are supposed to be in the armed forces and not there at the same time, I don't want to, I'm not a hundred percent sure that, you know, those 51,000, all of them have necessarily like left their posts on the battlefield or rotated home for a short period of leave and then didn't return. You know, all these things are probably going on. So at the start of the year, Kiev was estimated to have between 500,000 and 800,000 active duty soldiers and, and an estimated 300,000 reservists. The Ukrainians have also sustained casualties fighting to defend Ukraine from Russian advances of and Kiev's Kursk invasion. So Kiev has taken a lot of casualties this year. I, you know, I see people throw around numbers all the time. Certainly hundreds of thousands, I I think, you know, and that may not just be dead, but dead and injured to the point that they're not able to return to the battlefield. And so if you consider that, plus, again, another 30 to 50,000 desertions, then this is a pretty significant portion of Kiev's military that has been lost this year. Additionally, Kiev is struggling to fill its ranks with fresh soldiers, leading Ukraine to already drop the conscription age from 27 to 25. But Kiev is still facing a manpower shortage, leading American politicians to push Ukraine to drop the draft age to 18. Ukraine has also resorted to allowing prisoners to leave jail if they join the military. One Ukrainian who deserted told the Times that prison was a better option than the military because, at least in prison, you know when you will be able to leave. And I think that really implies that a lot of these guys who end up getting conscripted really don't think that they will ever be able to leave and will end up dying somewhere on the battlefield. The number of Ukrainians that Kiev is prosecuting for desertions has increased significantly throughout the war. In 2022, 9,000, so almost the number it's increasing by month now, um, that was the number of desertions. And then last year it was 24,000, so we're already at double the 24 thousand number from 2023 and so my guess this is an increasing problem for ukraine that we're not going to hear a whole lot about this because really understanding the depth and the scope of the problem would require official sources either in washington or kiev to really reveal how many casualties they're taking how many desertions they're taking what is the actual size of their military right now how many members of their military are say outside of the country receiving training in a third country and all these 
these things uh, could really mean that Ukraine is really struggling to have enough soldiers to fight on the battlefield. So um, I, I'm not sure we're really going to get confirmation in all that information anytime soon. It may not even come till after the war. Um, then we start getting documents coming out after the war is over, revealing that at the time, you know, in October of 2024, the Ukrainians and the Americans were really desperate for soldiers. You know, maybe we find that in 2027, but I think they're going to continue to be very tight lipped about these numbers. And we're only going to get this little trickle of information that requires a little bit of speculation and interpretation to try to figure out how significant it actually is. Now, you know, let's go to this one next. Pentagon chief says he can't confirm claims about North Korean troops preparing to fight in Ukraine. I'm not going to go through this whole article because this is essentially what we, we assumed on this show, that there's not a bunch of uh, North Koreans fighting on the front lines for the Russians and that they're not deserting in large numbers. As I said previously on the show, I would almost be surprised if there wasn't I don't know, some North Koreans somewhere in Russian logistic command and control centers or something like that, somewhere behind the front lines. You know, these two countries have talked about really ramping up their military relationship. And that's something that happens. A lot of the weapon systems that are used in modern warfare are very complex. They take a lot of training. And, you know, what better training would there be than to gain some battlefield experience? Now, again, I don't think necessarily that the Russians would want North Koreans operating on the front line. It might not, you know, bring the best optics. Again, you know, they're looking to conquer some of Ukraine. Uh, that I don't think they want North Korean forces fighting inside of Russia in Kursk and say, and, and so... You, you know, I think they want this to be a Russian operation. At the same time, again, if these two countries are really deepening their military ties, as they say, maybe the North Koreans are supplying some weapons to the Russians, too. And so the, you know, logistic information help making sure all these weapon systems are operational and that the North Koreans know how to use them once they go to Pyongyang would mean that there may be some level of military cooperation and, uh, you know, North Korean troops in or around Ukraine uh, to help the Russian fight or at least learn from the Russians as they are fighting. All right, next up here, this one from Dave DeCamp, uh, the October 21st, antiwar.com, Austin visits Ukraine announcing $400 million weapons package. So Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin made an unannounced visit to Ukraine on Monday and announced a new $400 million weapons package. The Pentagon said that during the visit, Austin will meet with Ukrainian leadership and underscore the U.S. commitment to providing Ukraine with the security assistance it needs to defend itself from Russian aggression on the battlefield. Austin's visit comes as Russian forces are currently taking bad territory in Russia's Kursk and continuing to make gains in eastern Ukraine. In the face of these advances, Ukrainian President Zelensky has unveiled his so-called victory plan, which is essentially a list of demands for more military aid from his Western backers. And you know, again, this isn't necessarily to promote Zelensky's narrative or anything like that, but it really is extremely unfair for the Pentagon to roll out in the White House to continue to roll out this piece of propaganda saying that we're meeting with the Ukrainians and we're giving them everything we need. We're helping them in this fight and we're doing this. They're doing this so they could come to the American people and say, we're defending democracy from the evil Russians and we're making sure that we're, you know, enforcing international world order and we're doing all the right things on the global stage. And Donald Trump wouldn't do that. So that's why you you, you need us. When in reality, the Ukrainians are losing this war. The only solution that the Americans are presenting them is drop the conscription age to 18 and sacrifice another half generation of your young men to this meat grinder. But Ukraine is asking for weapons that they're not getting. And so to claim that we're giving Ukraine everything it needs to defend itself as it's currently losing territory on the battlefield it is a real joke and a slap in the face to the Ukrainians. And um, I, I mean, it's just it's a real sick piece of propaganda. So Zelensky is asking for NATO support 
to support long-range strikes inside Russian territory and for NATO countries to help shoot down Russian missiles and drones over Ukraine. But so far, those requests, which risk nuclear war, have been rejected by the U.S. and NATO. And again, when I make that point that the U.S. isn't giving Rus uh, Ukraine everything they need to win this war, the point isn't that I think that should happen so, we, so Ukraine could win the war, because that means direct war between Russia and NATO and likely a nuclear war. What I mean is that the White House should be very honest and clear-eyed not only to the American people but also to the Ukrainians about what we are actually able to provide and the amount of help that we could give them and that should lead the Ukrainians to make whatever decisions that they need to make so if the Ukrainians hear this and they decide that hey we want to cut a deal with Russia because we cannot stop them from taking more Ukrainian territory without these long-range weapons systems then that's the message that needs to be relayed so Ukraine could cut the best deal possible now, but that's not what the White House wants. They want their propaganda for the November election and they want to weaken Russia. And it's really not even about Russia. It's all about they don't want China to have a strong partner in Russia. So, despite no clear path to Ukrainian victory, the U.S. continues to fuel the proxy war with fresh weapon shipments, and this is what is in the $400 million arms package. Ammunition for HIMARS, 155mm and 105mm artillery ammunition. It does not say if those are the cluster variant or not. I would assume they were. 60mm, 81mm, and 120mm mortar systems and rounds. Tow missiles, javelin, and AT-4 anti-armor systems, M113 armored personnel carriers, satellite communications equipment, small arms and ammunition, grenade and training equipment, demolitions equipment and munitions, equipment to protect critical national infrastructure. I would be interested to know what that one is. And then the Pentagon also released a fact sheet that said that the U.S. has committed 59.5 billion in weapons for Ukraine since the Russian invasion in February. Uh, 22, including all types of other aid, the proxy wars cost the U.S. taxpayer at least 186 million. And I would think that that 59 uh, billion number is far higher. That 59 billion number, I think, does include how the Pentagon kind of cheats and in their uh, accounting trips, right? So. Again, I, I've explained this on the show before, so I don't want to spend a ton of time on it. But most of the uh, arms, including this package that the U.S. sends to Ukraine, are through the Presidential Drawdown Authority, or the PDA. Which means, you know, we have Humvees, Javelin missiles, Patriot systems, in American weapons stockpiles. And the President, as Commander-in-Chief, can send those other places throughout the world. However, the Pentagon does need to be able to buy new systems to replace those old systems so the American, you know, military can operate it as it would like to. And initially, in the way it's supposed to work, is that the funds that the Congress appropriates through the PDA. So let's say a new Patriot system costs a billion dollars, right? Well, we assess that we have this old one. It's got some dings. It's been used a few times. Uh, you know, we, we have some more upgrades on the modern systems. They work just a tiny bit better. And so we're going to value this one at, oh, uh, $600 million. And so that's, uh, you know, they've just saved themselves $400 million. And who knows what the actual value of this equipment is and it's all i'm sure just made up in pentagon uh spreadsheets anyway and so i think this has really drastically reduced the amount of money at least in the pentagon fat sheet that we have spent on this war and, and the number is truly quite a bit higher all right Next up here, this one, Dave DeCamp, October 20th, antiwar.com. Iran denies any role in drone attack on Netanyahu's house. So Iran's permanent mission to the United Nations has denied that Tehran played any role in a drone attack that targeted the home of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Saturday, which caused no casualties. So the mission said... According to the Tehran Times, we reject the baseless accusations made by the Zionist regime regarding Iran's involvement. Iran's mission said Hezbollah was behind the attack, but so far the Lebanese group has not taken responsibility. We have already responded to the regime's previous crimes. This action was taken by Lebanese Hezbollah. So when this initially happened, 
there you know a lot of questions as far as who carried out this attack and, and how it happened you know I, I still have some questions such as how a drone got through and hit the prime minister's house you wonder if maybe somebody in the military isn't the israeli military isn't too happy with benjamin netanyahu and some air defense system just ha- happened to not you know function properly or something like that but There was some speculation, oh, maybe this was some kind of false flag by the Israelis, with the Iranians saying it was Hezbollah, even without a statement from Hezbollah, I will go ahead and say that I'm pretty sure Hezbollah did carry out this attack. So the denial from Iran comes as Israeli officials are pointing the finger at Tehran for the attack, calling for a response. The Israeli foreign minister, Israel Katz, rejected the denial, calling the Iranian statement lies. So Katz wrote on Etz, the primary proxy, the tentacle Iran created, funded, armed, trained, and now controls in all its operations, is suddenly portrayed as an independent entity. Your lies and false pretenses won't help you. You are responsible. So I think, you know, there's kind of two points to make on this. Hezbollah is, you know, something of an Iranian proxy. I think, you know, to state it as they're just an Iranian proxy force, Hezbollah does have interest. They they defend southern Lebanon, and and that does seem their primary concern, along with defending the the Palestinians in Gaza, uh, in part because of the huge Palestinian population in Lebanon. Uh, you know, again, they do receive a lot of support, a lot of training. Uh, when the former leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, was killed, an IRGC commander was killed alongside him. So, obviously, a lot of ties between the Iranians and Hezbollah. However, the Hezbollah, I think, does act independently and to an extent, you know, within its own self interest. I don't think they would launch an uh, aggressive war on. Israel, if they didn't want to, if they didn't want to, you know, carry out this attack. And additionally, with Israel assassinating at least one of their leaders recently, uh, you would assume that Hezbollah would have all the interest to carry out a similar attack against Israel. So I don't think they necessarily needed Iranian prodding or anything like that. Now, the other point I want to make here is with as much as Hezbollah's leadership that has been taken out by Israel over the past couple months, I think it's at least possible that Iran may not have the same level of ties, control, or however you want to say it, over Hezbollah leadership as they may have 12 months ago. Uh, And that who knows how maybe independently some of the arms of Hezbollah, some of the different battalions and uh, command structure under the Hezbollah leadership is operating at this point. Now, I'm not saying that some commander was just able to launch an assassination attempt against Netanyahu on his own, but, uh, you know, I a, a year ago I would have said it would seem unlikely that this attack would have been carried out without Iranian support, given the chaos and level of bombing going on and the uh, killing of several top level, level uh, levels of Hezbollah leadership. I- I'm not so sure about that anymore. So a couple more things from Dave's article here. Israel's Channel 12 reported that the drone attack on Netanyahu's home could give Israel, quote, greater legitimacy for a wider range of targets and its expected attack on Iranian territory. Israel has also been preparing to strike Iran in retaliation for the October 1st Iranian missile barrage that was fired into Israel, which came as a response to a series of Israeli escalations in the region. The U.S. and Israeli officials believe that the planned Israeli attack on Iran, which is expected to happen before the U.S. presidential election, will likely provoke a major regional war. Iran is warning that it will respond to any kind of attack on its territory. The Iranian foreign minister said Sunday that Iran has already pit targets and it will strike in response to an Israeli attack. He said any attack on Iran is considered crossing red lines and it will not go unanswered. And I think this is exactly what Netanyahu wants. I've been saying that for some time now, that Netanyahu wants the American people to feel like the Biden administration has embroiled them in another Middle East war. And this is going to help elect Donald Trump. All right, next up here, Israel bans aid groups from operating in Gaza. So Israel has banned six aid groups from providing medical care to the people of Gaza. Doctors who have worked inside the Strip have issued warnings about the massive human toll Israel's onslaught has wrecked. So on Thursday, the World Health Organization said it 
in, was informed by Tel Aviv that healthcare workers from six groups, including the Palestinian American Medical Association, PAMA, can no longer provide assistance in the besieged enclave. The WHO is concerned that Tel Aviv's ban will add more stress to the Strip's already strained healthcare system. The Gaza Health Ministry has reported that nearly 100,000 injuries have occurred over the past year, and of course, knowing that the true death toll is several times higher than the 42,000 put out by the Hamas, uh, the Gaza Health Ministry, I think it's you know worth speculating at least, but probably assuming that the number of injuries is not only far higher than 100,000, but multiple times higher than 100,000. So Israel made the decision to ban the organizations after 99 American healthcare workers signed an open letter accusing Israeli forces of intentionally murdering Palestinian children and estimating the number of dead in Gaza to be over 118,000. The a surgeon with PAMA led the letter and penned an op-ed in the New York Times calling for a U.S. arms embargo against Israel. Since October 7th, 2023, the Israeli military operations in Gaza have killed around 170 Palestinian journalists. The persistent attacks against the media have resulted in a lack of information about the bombardment's true toll. Western healthcare workers who go on aid missions inside the Strip are one of the few sources of information still able to relay to the West what is happening inside Gaza. If Tel Aviv bans the doctors from visiting Gaza, it will tighten the information blackout. All right, next up here, U.S. THAAD missile defense systems now operational in Israel. So the U.S. Thermal High Altitude Aerial Defense THAAD battery that has been deployed to Israel with about 100 U.S. troops is now operational according to the Israeli broadcaster Khan. The U.S. deployed the missile system in anticipation of an Israeli attack on Iran in retaliation for the October 1st Iranian missile barrage that was fired at Israel, which came into response to a series of Israeli escalations in the region. The U.S. and Israel are anticipating Iran to hit back in a response to any Israeli attack, making U.S. troops deploy with the THAAD a potential target of the Iranian ballistic missiles and also a U.S. a party to this war. Israel's Channel 12 reported on Friday that Israel has requested the U.S. send another THAAD system, signaling Israel is expecting a major escalation. There has been no word yet on whether the U.S. is considering the request. Throughout the past year, the U.S. has deployed additional military assets to the Middle East to show support for Israel, but sending the THAAD system was the first significant U.S. deployment on Israeli territory, although an unknown number of U.S. special operating forces have been on the ground in Israel helping with intelligence. The U.S. military the U.S. may support Israel's attack on Iran either by launching airstrikes of its own or by providing intelligence. Either way, the U.S. will be directly involved in a full-blown Iran-Israel war since it's vowing to defend Israel from any Iranian reprisal. And again, major Middle East war right before the election. All right, you know what? Let's talk about the election just a little bit more, then we'll do some uh, kind of stories from inside the strip and talk about how bad it is in northern Gaza. Harris campaign denies she Israel is committing a genocide in Gaza. So Vice President Kamala Harris' presidential campaign has clarified that she does not believe Israel is committing a genocide in Gaza after an incident at a rally suggested that she did. At a campaign event at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, a protester interrupted Harris and said she invested billions of dollars in genocide and pressed her about the massive child casualties in Gaza, repeatedly describing the Israeli onslaught as a genocide. Addressing the students, Harris said, What he's talking about, it's real. That's not the subject that I came here to discuss today, but it's real and I respect his voice. So this this must be the line they told her to say in response uh, because she was like, giving the response that I'm speaking uh, to all the pro-Palestinian protesters, my guess is that wasn't going over very well. And so now they gave her this line, which is 
also really bad. So a spokesperson for the Harris campaign said Sunday that the comments made by the protester don't reflect the position of the Biden-Harris administration or the vice president's stance. The spokesperson added that Harris didn't agree with defining the war as a genocide and she has expressed such a stance in the past as this is not her position. The International Court of Justice has ruled that it is plausible that Israel is committing genocide against the Palestinian population in Gaza. There have been massive civilian casualties in the onslaught, and the Israeli forces have purposely targeted children. A group of 99 American healthcare workers who volunteered in Gaza said in an open letter to Harris and Biden that each one of them treated preteen children who were shot in the head or chest on a regular or even daily basis. The American healthcare workers also estimate that over 118,000 Palestinians, or over 5% of the population, has all already been killed. Despite the mass slaughter, the Biden administration maintains that Israel is not committing a genocide, since that would mean the U.S. officials are supporting a genocide, uh, but that is exactly what is happening. Harris has attempted to, I guess, it not even soften her language, but her campaign has attempted to portray her statements on the war in Gaza as the language being softened, and Again, it's not really accurate, but that that has been the portrayal that they're trying to put forward. It's just it, it's not working. And it's obviously untrue. Now, this is especially at Spose. Uh, this is the Libertarian Institute debrief. You can sign up for it at the Libertarian Institute right in the top hand corner of the screen. Uh, just, you know, sign up for our email list. I write one of these uh, about four or five times a week. Israel holds a genocide conference. So several Israeli political leaders partied and planned for the genocide of Gaza during a two day summit. One of the most inflammatory statements was made by the social equality minister and the Kud MP uh, member of the Knesset, May Golan. She said, we will hit them where it hurts their land. Anyone who uses their plot of land to plan another Holocaust will receive from us, with God's help, another Nakba that they will tell their children and grandchildren about for the next 50 years. However, the star of the event was the Israeli National Security Minister Itmar Ben Gavir. The crowd called for the extreme settler to become the Nets Israeli Prime Minister, and this is what he said to the, the chant of cheers. What we've learned this year is that everything is in our hands. We are the owners of this land. Yes, we experienced a terrible catastrophe on October 7th, but we need to understand one year later is that so many Israelis have changed their thinking. They have changed their mindset. They understand that when Israel adds, it is the rightful owners of this land. This is what brings results. I see it in the terrorist jail cells. We look at, we took away their jelly sandwiches. We took away their chocolate. We took away their TV sets and their ping pong tables and their exercise time. You see them whining and crying in their cells. And that's our proof. We decided we can, we secede. We shall encourage the voluntary transfer of all Gaza citizens. We will offer them an opportunity to move to other countries because that land belongs to us. And so the explicit calls from genocide from a high-ranking member of the Israeli government and a member of Netanyahu's own Likud are extremely revealing about Chalavi's true intentions, that is, to eliminate the Palestinians or the removal of all Palestinians from any territory claimed by Israel. The conference in Israel should force the Biden administration's hand in ending armed transfers to Tel Aviv. However, the White House is unlikely to be moved. Worse yet, both candidates for next month's election are vowing to give Tel Aviv an even brighter green light. So, you know, bad bad news there, and it's just it's crazy with Harris's campaign statement that Israel isn't committing a genocide and the Israelis are openly saying that that's what they want. Uh, you really, you, you shouldn't not take them at their word when that's what they're calling for. All right. A couple of articles here about the killing in uh, Gaza. So Israeli strikes in Northern Gaza kill at least 87 Palestinians. This one from Dave DeCamp, 
October 20th. At least 87 Palestinians were killed by an Israeli strike in a residential building in Bet Lahana, a city in northern Gaza, CNN reported on Sunday. The report said that Gaza's health ministry, which said the dead included 27 bodies that had been recovered and 60 bodies still stuck under the rubble, and at least 40 people were wounded by the strike and some in very critical condition. Footage of the aftermath at the Kowaldi Hospital, where the casualties were taken, showed that children are among the dead. An unidentified Palestinian man told CNN that the buildings were sheltering displaced families. We call on international community to end the war. We beg you. We are civilians with no connection to anyone. We demand that you stop the war. That, that was his statement. So the massive strides come as Israeli soldiers are attempting to carry out an ethnic cleansing campaign known as the General's Plan in northern Gaza, which has been under tightening siege for over two weeks and cut off from food, medicine, water, and other basic needs. The Israeli military has ordered the evacuation of three hospitals in northern Gaza, but the staff refused to leave so they could treat their patients. The Gaza Health Ministry said Saturday that at least two patients died at the Indonesian hospital due to the Israeli siege. It said the death of two patients inside the Indonesian hospital in the northern Gaza Strip as a result of the hospital siege and power outages and medical supplies. The occupation has imposed a severe siege on hospitals in northern Gaza since midnight last night as the Indonesian hospital was bombed and the other hospitals are besieged at the same time. It's just horrific, horrific war crimes to, to conduct and carry out. All right, last story up here today, dozens of Palestinians killed as Israel intensifies attacks on northern Gaza. So dozens of Palestinians were killed by Israeli forces in northern Gaza on Monday as Israel is intensifying attacks on the area in an effort to forcibly displace hundreds of thousands of Palestinians as a part of their general's plan. Medical sources told Turkey's Anadolu agency that at least 29 Palestinians were killed in northern Gaza on Monday. Later in the day, the Palestinian news agency Wafa said that at least 44 Palestinians were killed in the north and a total of 57 were killed across the strip. Gaza's health ministry usually puts the death toll out update each day, but did not on Monday. In its update on Sunday, the ministry said that at least 43,603 Palestinians have been killed by Israelis' assault since October 7th last year. That toll does not include Palestinians who are missing and presumed dead under the rubble or from indirect deaths caused by the war. The Israeli strikes on Monday included an attack on a school-turned-shelter in the Jabalia refugee camp. Wafa reported that the strike on the UN-run school killed at least 10 Palestinians and wounded 30 others. Paramedics told Anadulu that since of the Palestinians killed by the Israelis that targeted civilians waiting to fill up water containers in Jabalia, another strike killed four Palestinians near the Al-Yama Al-Sayed hospital in the Jabalia refugee camp. Middle East Eye reported that Israeli soldiers were raiding schools and forcing Palestinians out at gunpoint. According to an eyewitness, Israeli soldiers were separating men from their families and telling women and children to flee south. Israeli soldiers have acknowledged that the Israeli military is attempting to carry out the general's plan in northern Gaza. The plan calls for evacuating all civilians from the north and the extermination of anyone left behind, either by military action or a starvation blockade. All right, that's where I'm going to wrap up the show for today. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Back with more later in the week.